This is Support is Sexy, episode 133, with Chantrell P. Lewis, author of Dandelion, co-founder of ShopBlack.us, and founder of William and James. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so excited to have you here. As you know, it just would not be the same without you. So today, I am so excited about our guest, Ms. Chantrell P. Lewis. Chantrell is a curator. She is a purveyor of Black art, Black culture, Black style, the Black aesthetic. And the passion that she has for all of this really comes through in her conversation with me on this episode, but also in the work that she creates, not only in the art. She has a fantastic exhibit that is toured the world called the Dandelion Project. She has a book called Dandelion coming out in the spring, but she also is an evolving entrepreneur. So she has a business with her husband. She was just married last uh, last month, a month before last, within the past couple of months. She was married in a fantastic wedding. In, let me stop. This fantastic wedding in New Orleans, you all have to see the video. I have linked to it on Chantrell's show notes page. Myself and maybe about 200,000 other people have watched this video, maybe more at this point. It's growing. It's gone viral. The second line of her wedding, which is something that they do in New Orleans culture, have a link to that as well. But go watch the video. You will be inspired by all of this joy. And that's really what Chantrell talks about in this episode, too, how joy is incorporated in everything that she does from her businesses to her work. Black joy, especially, which is something none of us see enough of, especially within me. Media. So Chantrell, as I mentioned, is also co-founder of a business with her husband called shopblack.us. She's also founder of her own bow tie line called William and James, which is inspired by W.E.B. Du Bois and James Baldwin. So she has a lot going on. Great information in this episode. Great resources, too. I literally had two pages of notes of all of the things that she mentioned within the conversation, and I wanted to capture all that so that you all, wherever you are in the world because we have listeners in 73 countries thank you all for the support of sexy podcast so some of the references might not be familiar to people in other parts of the world or even people here so i wanted to capture as much as possible all of those links will be on chantrell's show notes page at support is sexy podcast.com search chantrell s-h-a-n-t-r-e L-L-E, and you'll see everything with all of the links there. So what you're going to learn in this episode, one of the things that Chantrell also talks about, which I am a big advocate of, is vision, the importance of having vision. And if you so practice having a vision board, something I do every year, something she says she's done every year, something she's actually done since she was a teenager before she even knew it was called vision board. Certainly she knew it was having a vision, but this idea of having a vision. So Chantrell talks about how to be a woman of vision, the importance of vision boards and getting clear on how and why they work, how to incorporate your passion into your business, what it takes to be an entrepreneur, Also, why spirituality, love, and joy take practice, how to break down your goals and tackle them, the importance of knowing what works for you and establishing best practices around that. So if someone says that they are a morning person and every entrepreneur should be a morning person, but morning doesn't work for you, you don't have to do that. I know I've fallen into that trap sometimes of thinking this is what every other entrepreneur says they do to be successful, but if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. She also talks about the value of having an accountability partner. You know, we love that. Support is sexy. Also, remembering that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So you must get rid of people who don't believe in the possibilities. All for that. 
Everybody Can't Come. We did an episode on that too. Lastly, Chantrell talks about why you have to do you and be authentic to your own vision and dreams. So as I always say, I know you're going to love this episode. I truly know you are going to love the long list of resources that Chantrell provides to us during the conversation. As I said, go to supportissexypodcast.com so you can check out any of those. Click on the link and you can find out more information. All right. So without further ado, my pleasure to present Chantrell P. Lewis. So Chantrell, thank you so much for joining us on an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you. The same here. The, you know, the pleasure is all mine. Excellent. Now, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think, honestly, I would say maybe as a child, because my um, stepdad was um, such a, I mean, he always talked about like owning the power of like owning your own business and, um, you know, like how important it was for black people to like create wealth in a black community. And so I think it was through my, you know, my dad's love for, um, you know, business ownership and entrepreneurship that I actually fell in love with it. Um, and then, um, in grad school, I actually did a study on the state of black owned businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, it wasn't like I was in a business program. I was in an African American studies program, but, um, in our ethnography class, I decided to do, um, yeah, the study on the state of black owned businesses, because at the time I was actually interested in, um, starting my own, uh, coffee house. Mm. Um, and, but this was like right before Katrina, Katrina hit him from New Orleans. And so, you know, things, you know, plans change, but, um, I went around and I interviewed black owned, um, uh, owners, customers, employee employees at coffee houses in, um, in Philadelphia. And so, you know, I think I've just always been passionate about supporting, our businesses, um, supporting like people in the black community. And so I think it, you know, it was through that love of, of our community that I fell in love with entrepreneurship. Now, what was a young Chantrell like growing up in New Orleans? <laughs> <laughs> she was a tomboy. I was, um, very much so a tomboy. Um, to the point where my parents were just always like, why don't you wear dresses? And, more skirts and, you know, just trying to um, make me fit into this, um, this stereotypical category of what it meant to be, you know, like a girl. Mm -hmm. um, but I was very loud, very uh, pro-black. I wasn't, I, 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 you know, I self-idea as African-centered now, but as a child, I was very pro-black. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, my, you know, my parents, um, all three of my parents, um, both of my dads and my mom, like, you know, very, um, supportive of like, you know, black culture and black arts and like black ideas in the, in the community. And so I was like, you know, reading about the Haitian revolution and Tusali Overture when I was like five years old. I mean, all of the books that I read were by, you know, black authors and about our history and our culture. And so it was at the forefront of like who I was, you know, as a, you know, as a child, but then I was also like rapping had a rap group. Uh oh. So, yeah, it was Gangsta Brown was my uh, nickname. We uh -oh. wore these daishikis and African <laughs> medallions. I love it. I know it was so funny, but I mean, it was. I was really just very proud to be black. Um, very much assertive. I was a nerd, um, but I just had very big ideas about my life and my future. Very inspired by Oprah um, when I was a child, and so I just had like these like huge ideas about like what I wanted to accomplish in life and who I wanted to be. And just being like, you know, just not having any limits to, you know, what I could become. Who were some of your greatest influences? You mentioned Oprah, but what were some of your influences that um, helped you to become that child who you were with these big dreams? Or do you think that was just a part of who you are? Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, I was I mean, any and everything I read. I mean, like it, at different phases of my life, I think I've been influenced by different individuals, particularly in history. So, you know, as a child, I was clearly strongly influenced by, you know, leaders of the civil rights movement and by the black power movement. So I remember even reading Asada's um, autobiography when I was in the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And 
memorizing her poems and like the rest of my friends are like who's this you know Asada Shakur and I'm like Asada Shakur was a black panther and she escaped Cuba and you know just telling my friends about this woman whose life and whose courage like you know I found like extremely remarkable and you know just like you know inspiring and profound and so you know, I, you know like I said at different um stages of my life I think I've been influenced by different individuals um in grad school I was definitely highly influenced by um you know Garvey and the boys and Baldwin uh Zora Neale Hurston um and Catherine Dunham have played like huge influences on my life so you know my life is definitely I found inspiration in individuals in the African diaspora um who understood what it meant to be like pan-African mm-hmm. um and like creating and developing community across the diaspora um you know then in grad school yeah I was introduced to the work of Dr. Martha Moreno Vega and Dr. Deborah Willis and so uh what they've accomplished as women and as scholars and as um, as artists and practitioners, um, definitely has had a huge impact on my career as a, a curator as well. And so I'm like constantly finding inspirations, whether it's like in the leaders of, you know, African independence movements or even in, um, you know, like, you know, b- the work of black feminists today, you know, like who are now my friends, like people like Joan Morgan and Brittany Cooper, mm-hmm. Dr. Yaba Blay and Kyla, um, Dr. Kyla Story, like all of these people. Regina Bradley, you know, like influenced me um, in the work that I do. Now, you are a proud native of New Orleans. Everybody who knows you or knows about you knows <laughs> you're all about New Orleans. All about New Orleans. All about New Orleans. I love it. And um, But you've traveled the world and created work that reflects those travels as well. But New Orleans seems to really be embedded in a lot of your work. Um, Definitely. What you do. How would you say that home impacts your work and your choices, especially as an artist? So I, you know, when I went to, I, I tell people that my, I think my identity and my sense of self um, are, you know, is shaped strongly by both New Orleans and, and, and me attending Howard. It's like, these were both like, I think, defining um, like aspects of, you know, m- my growth into like who I am, you know, as a woman. And, you know, growing up in New Orleans, it wasn't until I think, I went to Howard that being from New Orleans like actually had a place because when you know growing up in New Orleans we had a very insular culture there so what we did was like the norm like second lines were the norm and like Mm -hmm. the way we celebrated Black Mardi Gras was the norm and like our our culinary traditions and our music and the fact that you know there would be like 12 year old boys playing French horns in the, in the projects. Like, I mean, that was just a part of the fabric of our city, you know, which is easily the most African city in the U S right. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't until I got outside of New Orleans that I went to Howard and then I was interacting with black people across the diaspora that not understood what it meant to be black and black American, by way of the U.S., by way of the U.S. South, by way of New Orleans, and it became a very specific thing. And so then I understood that our accents, like, you know, even the way I spoke, like, we speak, like, I mean, you know, subject verb agreement aside, like, I, I, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm committed to talking like and sounding like a woman from New Orleans. Like, code switching was only important up to, like, a certain point because like, I wanted to speak in a language that my, my grandmother understood, right? Mm-hmm. So even as I was interacting with my friends from Atlanta and um, New York and Boston and the Dominican Republic like, and all these places, across, you know, Nigeria, all these places across the diaspora, I was very committed to being a person from New Orleans. And so no, no matter where I travel in the world, you know, if I'm doing work in the Netherlands or if I'm in the UK doing work and people ask me where I'm from, you know, even though I've been living on the East Coast now for at least half of my life, you know, I tell people I'm from New Orleans because that's, you know, that has informed how I see myself in the world as a black woman, as a person of diaspora, a person whose lens is, is clearly very much so shaped by a, a very specific type of black experience you know i grew up black catholic um you know i was aware of like african spiritual tra- traditions through like voodoo and and hoodoo in new orleans i you know i have a certain type of relationship with you know music because of in dance and like you know uh, certain types of culture because of new orleans and then in that whenever i travel to like haiti or bahia 
or, you know, like West Africa, I'm able to like really identify with other types of traditions because I can connect them to New Orleans. And so it's just, you know, essential um, to like, you know, my identity, to my personality, my core being. Um, and, you know, it's something that I'm very proud of, you know, it's particularly post Katrina, something mm-hmm. that I you know, like in me recognizing and honoring my ancestors, like I have to like acknowledge like before anything that I'm a woman from New Orleans. I love it. Now, you know, we have to talk about your wedding video, right? <laughs> Speaking about New Orleans and honoring New Orleans, I'm going to have a link. To, is it public? I think I can link to it, is, it right? Yeah, it, it, it is, is public. public. Yes, yeah. it was featured on OK Africa. Or was, OK, right? right? OK, yeah. Player, somewhere. Uh, OK Africa, yeah. OK Africa. Uh huh. For everyone listening who has not seen Chantrell's <laughs> wedding video, you will feel like you will wish that you were there. You won't feel like you were there, but you will wish that you were there. So we're going to link to that. But what I want to add, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. The day seems amazing and getting married obviously is amazing, but it seemed like an incredible experience for everybody. Um, but the video, I will say it, I, it must have at least 100. I know I shared it. It must have at least 150,000 views by now. Sure. Yeah. Much more probably, right? Yeah, it is. It is going viral. It's um, going viral. Yeah. That's amazing. It's It's so good. I can't even hardly talk about it. But um, it seemed like an incredible, obviously, to be there. But what was it like for you, I want to know, to see the video and all of that black joy after the fact? What was that experience like for you when you first saw it? You know, Elaine, it's so crazy that I, it was like it was an out of body experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, going through it. And, and it's funny because like I was very, very present. You know, during the entire weekend, it was like a three, four day weekend um, of events. And it it came at the end of a very, very, very busy year. Like, I know a lot of people can't wait to see 2016 go because a lot of, the, you know, the violence we experienced in the community, you know, a lot of deaths that, you know, happened. You know, we lost Prince and so many other people. Um, but for me personally, like 2016 was one of the best years of my adult life. And I mean, I've completed my initiation into local me priesthood. Um, my exhibition, you know, traveled to like San Francisco and the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I got a book deal with Aperture for my book that's coming out next year. And then like I ended, you know, I came out of my, my, my initiation year and like three months later I was like getting married and so I was like I had no idea how I was gonna put it off I mean I definitely didn't do it alone like my planner Fresh Johnson my um you know my the person who designed you know all of my like you know my initiation suite uh, I mean invitation suite uh Hadia Williams there were like so many people my videographer Alex Colby the 23 year old designer who did my dress in a week Mm-hmm. Um, Nate, Nate White, I guess so many people, my parents who you know, paid for the wedding, right. like so many people, um, my, you know, my best friends, um, like just so many people helped, helped me to pull it off. I really did not know how I was going to do it. Like, I was just like, I don't even have time to plan. Like, I literally did not like, a month before the wedding, I was in the UK. Mm. And so like for two weeks with my exhibition and I have a full time job. So I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off. Like there, you know, were 400 people on the guest list. And so I was like, I have no idea. And it was like a very spiritual thing. And I think the thing that was most important to both myself and, um, and Tony was that people came and had a good time. Like, I was like, I don't want a formal sit down dinner. I want people to dance from the time we jumped the broom until the time, like they have to leave, like they get kicked out of the Ace Hotel. I just (laughs) want people to have a really good time and that was like critical and that was essential to everything that we did and I think you know that's what happened Mm -hmm. and I mean like when I look at the video which was done by you know my good friend Alex Colby um it I I mean I've watched it probably a thousand times myself like I mean we just and it's so funny because I I wasn't you know I wasn't trying to be like the bride's bride clearly I had on a gold sequence dress so you were definitely doing your own thing as yeah as you you told us from my haircut to, you know, like, you know, my attire, like, I, you know, even, you know, Tony wearing a, the uh, wine color suit. I definitely did not want, like, to be a typical bride. I'm 38 years old. You know, I finally found love. And I just didn't want to feel like a princess, right? I'm like, I'm a queen. Like, I'm already royal, right? Mm-hmm. And that wasn't like I was just waiting for my the, my prince to come and save me. I was just like, I'm, a, you know, an, a very successful woman. 
and I'm looking for someone to share the rest of my life with. And, you know, my husband supports me and celebrates me for like, you know, everything that makes me the individual that I am. And I think that's what the video just expresses. I mean, it was just like joy, like sheer black, unadulterated, you know, like unadulterated joy. And I think that the thing that, um, that was made it so powerful was like it came a week after you know like the election and I just remember feeling sick to my stomach after the election and I was just like I can't believe I'm gonna be depressed during my wedding and I, I I called you know my godfather had a conversation with him and he shared a story with me um I don't know it verbatim but it's something about uh the children of the cotton not being able to be swallowed and like you know we uh as African Americans being children of the cotton you know because like you know our ancestors primarily uh, cultivated cotton, you know, mm-hmm. during slavery. And like he, you know, talked about, told me this like story, this parable of Pataki about how these birds try to swallow cotton seeds and they choked. And it was like, you know, we can't be swallowed. And once he told me that, it was like a few days before the wedding, I was good. Mm. I was like, we're about to have a great time. And so it was just so beautiful to see like friends from, you know, my life and from Tony's life from around the world coming to celebrate us and those who weren't able to join us, like, you know, celebrating us from afar. Um, and I think that's what, you know, the, the video uh, reflected. It absolutely did. And I think it, it reflected the intention that you just laid out for us. You could see that it was very much about a celebration, having a good time and really lifting people as you all were united together. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like I, you know, ancestors were very central to that entire, like everything. I mean, they were like, there with us like every step of the way and so um you know we did that you know to like express our love for each other but to express our love for our community our families and for like black people at large excellent now celebrating black people and black beauty and the black aesthetic black style all of that seems to be very important to you as a curator and an artist and a writer so tell us about then the the dandelion project and the dandelion book that's coming up that you mentioned earlier and how all of those things sort of tie into the celebration of blackness and black beauty and all of these other things yeah, so I first curated Dandelion, the exhibit, uh, six years ago. Um, my friend Ngozi Odita, who's actually the executive director of uh, Social Media Week Lagos, and she's uh, um, one of the uh, founders of what was known as Harriet's Alter Ego in Brooklyn, um, she invited me to curate this exhibition at her pop-up gallery space. And, um, you know, at the time, I, I really didn't, I mean, I could have, I had lots of different ideas. I was like, should I do an exhibition about HBCUs? I should do an exhibition about, you know, that celebrates like, you know, dark skin, you know, black women. And then I was just like, no, I really think I should do something that addresses uh, the stereo, the negative stereotyping of black men in the media. And since Harriet's was known for, for his style um, and creating and celebrating like unique black styles, like, you know, I should focus on, dandyism and you know prior to that I don't know that I was necessarily interested in dandyism I I did know that growing up in the south like you know the way that black men dressed um particularly the black men in the in 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 my family you know my dads my my uncles my grandfathers um you know they they took pride my brothers they took pride in the way they dressed and when I went to Howard I was like kind of surprised by like how guys on the east coast you know, like very they're casual. Like, dis- very casual. <laughs> like that disregard for dressing up. I mean, guys in New Orleans, I mean, in the South period, like the way they would starch their jeans. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like ironing is an art in the right, South. I was gonna right? say that it's an art, yeah. It is an art. I mean, I have so many friends on the East Coast. I'm like, I when I you know, I stay at their house, I the first question I ask, like, do you have an, an iron? iron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we have an ironing board because like, I might not be able to stay over if I can't <laughs> iron my clothes, right? And, um, you know, so I wanted to celebrate black men and I, you know, I thought about uh, black dandyism and Monica Miller, who's uh, the author of Slaves to Fashion and she's a professor at Barnard. Um, she, she had just wrote this incredible book, like, you know, documenting the historical trajectory of black dandyism from like the 17th century until like, you know, um, you know, 21st century. And so um, I was like, yeah, I mean, like, this is cool. This is a way to like celebrate black men 
without um, like focusing on a negative, right? Mm -hmm. And just focusing on like something to me that was like an interesting like phenomena in our community. And what I didn't realize at the time was how big um, black dandyism was and like that there was actually like a major resurgence of black dandyism. So the exhibition continued to grow in popularity. Um, it began to tour throughout the U.S. Um, and Europe. And um, I was approached by Aperture, um, you know, to publish the book. And it was just kind of like a, a vision and a dream come true, like something I had put on my vision board like several years ago, like that Danny Light is going to become this, you know, best selling book. And um, it and, and, and that's what's happening. Um, and I think that it's just so um, the reason why so many people love love the project itself is I mean, like there's so many reasons, but one is just you know, it's gratifying to see well-dressed black men, regardless of their sexual orientation, you know, their the socioeconomic status, like to see a well-dressed black man, mm -hmm. like it does something for your soul, right? And, I mean, honestly, I remember like when I first curated the exhibition, I was like, I'm gonna find my husband mm. through this exhibition. I was like, it's gonna be some fine, well-dressed black man <laughs> who's gonna, gonna hear come about through. Me, he's gonna come through. <laughs> and that's gonna be my man, right? So it was like very selfish reasons also why I uh, curated Danny Lyon, which I actually met Tony um, through Danny Lyon. Like he saw a post and he sent me a message on Facebook. You manifested that. Yeah, I manifested. I was like, look at that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think people you know, just really love to see like, you know, it, you know, it, uh, well-dressed black men. I mean, it just does something for us. Like it's a sense of, of pride and inspiration. And then I think it's like very interesting because it's like also an anthropological project because you get to see black men dressing this way in the Congo, in Johannesburg, in Paris and New Orleans and Brooklyn and like all throughout the diaspora and it's not like these are men who are necessarily in communication with one another um it's you know these men are just dressing up this way um whether it's because they're like influenced by their grandfather's generation or uh you know like being dapper you know just does something for them professionally you know for their self-esteem so it's just like you know an amazing project that um, a lot of people uh, can relate to regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of sexuality and age. Um, and I mean, I'm just like very proud of it. Uh, it's a wonderful, beautiful um, exhibit. I really love it when I was looking at it. And just like you said, the images are just so powerful. They're, I don't know if quiet is the word, but there's sort of a, a quiet confidence about a lot of the images that make them powerful. If that yeah. makes sense, seeing the, no, the two of those things next to each other. Let's talk a little bit about vision. I know you, you've mentioned it in different ways a couple of times. When you were at school, you went to Howard. I won't hold right. it against you. I went to Hampton. <laughs> it's okay. We're cool. It, it We're is okay. Cool. Yes, it's yes, okay. Yes. It's, it's HBC okay. you love. Exactly. HBC exactly. <laughs> Did you always have, um, has vision, I should say, always been something important to you? So at, at that time, did you know what you wanted to sort of be when you got out of school? I know. You, where did you go to grad school? I went to the temple, so that's how I came to Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Okay. Yeah. And did you know what your uh, what professional path you wanted to follow at that point? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. I mean, I but vision, yeah, vision was it's like before I knew about the secret, before I knew about the law of attraction, mm -hmm. um, when I was a senior at um Xavier Prep, which is an all black school for girls, private school for girls in New Orleans. Um I decided very late that I wanted to, um, you know, go to Howard. So I think, I mean, I, I applied only to HBCUs because I knew I wanted to have that black experience. Thanks to a different world. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the fact that like, you know, for four generations, people in my family had been uh, going to um, HBCUs. But um, I think because I applied so late, they had already given out all their scholarships and they were like, you know, you're accepted, but you know, we don't have any money to give you. And I was like, I'm going to Howard. My mom was like, no, you're going to Xavier. You know, you got a full scholarship today. You're going to Xavier. I was like, I'm going to Howard. I put a poster of Howard, like right by my bed, like right above my bed. And so when I woke up in the morning, that was the first thing that I saw. And then when I, you know, before I went to sleep at night, that was the last thing I saw. Mm -hmm. And I just remember envisioning myself, like walking across the campus I was like thinking about all the guys from New York I was going to meet that were like, you know, baggy jeans and like Timberland boots. Like, I mean, I was like, oh, it's going to be some New York dude that's going to call me shorty. And that's going to be my boyfriend. <laughs> like, that is why I'm going to Howard, right? Mm -hmm. So I was boy crazy, super boy crazy. And 
Um, and I, and I, every day I looked at that, I was caught in school every day. And then like one day during the summer, I got a letter saying I, you know, been awarded a full scholarship. And so mm. before I even knew about the law of attraction, I felt like I was creating a vision for my life. And then when I read Deepak Chopra's seven spiritual laws of success after I graduated, I mean, at the time I still didn't know what I wanted to do. Like I, um, I was a biology pre-med and African-American studies major, decided at the last minute I did not want to become a doctor. Mm. Um, I was actually interested in doing TV and radio and started working at the radio station WPGC in um, DC. But then I was also teaching. And so I was just trying to figure it out. And while I was trying to figure it out, I thought like, you know, maybe I should go back to school. Um, came to Philly um, on a college tour with my, my students and went to the African American Museum in Philadelphia and fell in love. I was like, oh my God, like this whole entire institution, like four stories are dedicated to telling our story, our narratives as people of African descent, our art, our history, our culture. And I was like, I would love to work here. Like, I, and Being a curator was not even uh, an option for me or becoming a scholar of Africana studies. I just wanted to study black people. So I came to grad school and, and, and started volunteering at the, uh, at the museum and curated my first exhibition. And then, you know, the rest is kind of like black history. Um, now, how did you, you went from volunteer to being able to curate? Did you have conversations with people while you were there and say, this is something that I'm interested in? Or how did that come about? No, it literally started with me volunteering. I got, you know, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Deb Willis's sister, um, Leslie uh, Willis Lowry. She, you know, I met her and she's like, we need, you know, some volunteer do docents. So I volunteered. And I mean, because I was so passionate and mm -hmm. because I am you know, very assertive and very aggressive and um, ambitious, you know, like I was spending more time at the museum than they were, they were asking. So they hired me as a part-time um, museum educator, still spending more hours there. I started a, a young friends group at the museum to bring other young 20 somethings into the museum to support the museum and its, its programming and to raise money for the museum. And um, I was, I saw Dr. Deb Woods's, um exhibition, um, Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, which uh, chronicled the lives of black people through photography, um, like what we did on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. And I was like, you know, this is what I want to do. Like mm -hmm. whatever, whatever she was able to do with that exhibition, that's what I wanted to do. And I remember it was actually a photograph of a woman dancing on top of a casket. And before I read the wall label, I knew that that was in New Orleans. And, um, and so the fact that uh, the like one photograph could tell a story about a place where I was from like the way that it impacted me and inspired me I was like this is what I want to do and so you know I was given an opportunity to curate an exhibition and I've been curating ever since curating all around the world ever since yeah that's amazing and now with the dandelion project as you mentioned that was on your vision board and and this idea too of it becoming a book a best-selling book Let's put that out there. A best-selling yes. book. Yes, best-selling book. In spring 2017, how will the book be different or how will it reflect the um, exhibition? So the book um, actually is broken up into like five different sections where I um, highlight the the men, women, um, the men and women of black contemporary black dandyism, the movements, the photographers uh, and the brands that have been a part of contemporary black dandyism. So, you know, I'm featuring everyone from like Janelle Monet and Jadena to uh, Street Etiquette and the Swankers of South Africa and La Sapir uh, and Kambula and Johannesburg um, to guys like Darnell Moore, uh, um, Teak Milan, who is a very dandy um, uh, activist and um, trans man. Um, and, you know, so the, the book um, really looks at the breadth of uh, black dandyism on a spectrum. So whereas the, the exhibition has primarily focused on cisgender um, black men, the book explores like black masculinity through masculine of center women and quaint trails and let's say, you know, trans men um, and then looking at, you know, just movements, you know, around the world, but also like featuring and focusing on the photographers who've been committed to like documenting 
um, you know, like black dandyism also as a phenomenon over like the past like 10, 15 years as well. What kind of impact do you hope the book will have? Wow, you know, I remember buying Jamel Shabazz's Black in the Days, mm-hmm. like in early like 2001. And that book transformed the way I saw um, photography as a medium, the way I saw like the photography of black people mm-hmm. as art, um, as like just everyday black life, like particularly at that time, you know, hip hop. And so in this case, like black dandyism. And so I just really, you know, I hope that the book like literally transform the way people like live their lives and like what's possible for their lives and like, whether like they're inspired by the idea that, um, you know, what was like this very humble exhibition has now become this like best selling book around the world. Um, whether it's, a, you know, like the pride that people see and how, you know, these men and women are dressing up. Um, and whether it's like, you know, people who want to become photographers or artists or fashion designers, like whatever it is, like whatever people are passionate about. I hope that, you know, the book actually inspires people to um, actually conceive of what's possible in their life, mm-hmm. um, and how they're thinking about possibility um, and, and have them like actually, you know, chase after um, their passions in life. I love it. Now, where can people find out more information about the book? I know it's uh, not coming out to spring 2017, and I'm sure it'll be available everywhere. But is there some place they can go or to sign up for an email or anything like that? People can go to, I would say go to the website that I haven't launched yet, but the dandelionproject.com, which is um, has not been launched yet. I'm still work in progress. Um, we're also very active on um on Facebook, uh, the Danny Lion Project. Okay. And then Aperture as well. Um, Aperture's website, aperture.org, um, has information about the book as well. Okay, the Danny Lion. So I'll make sure for everybody listening, I'll have links to everything, but this way people can hear it if they want to do that right now in the moment. Excellent. Yeah. That sounds wonderful. I can't wait. Thank you. Of course. Now, in addition to your work as a curator and artist, you're also an entrepreneur. Which yes. I found out recently. <laughs> so tell us about Shop Black. How did that idea come about and what's it all about? So when I first met Tony, he, I mean, he, like the way I talk about, you know, black people, black culture, black aesthetics, that's how Tony talks about black business and like mm-hmm. black wealth. And, you know, he's Nigerian and Nigerians are definitely well known, you know, business people. Uh, their business acumen is like unparalleled in the world and particularly entrepreneurship. And so, um, you know, like the more and more he talked about you know, his, the books that he read um, about, you know, entrepreneurship and the fact that he and his best friend, they both own, um, owned, well, they own um, shipping companies um, and, and, and companies that like ship products, you know, to different parts of the world. I was like, well, since you're talking about black owned business so much, like besides just owning one, like, why don't we um, launch a startup that focuses on black owned businesses? Mm-hmm. Like um, there used to be a, a website um, a long time ago called Soul of Africa, and it might actually still exist. And I was like, we need like a Soul of Africa for like the 21st century, like a sexy site where people can go mm-hmm. and they can find out about like black owned businesses, not only in America, but you know, throughout the globe, because, like, you know, when I travel, like, I'm always looking for, like, where can I go to, like, in, to eat? Like, where can I get my hair done? Right. Um, you know, like, where can I go and shop? You know, because I've always just really been committed to supporting Black-owned businesses. And, you know, like, anytime I get a chance to, like, support a Black-owned business, whether it's, like, going to the dentist or a gynecologist, like, these are real things that we're constantly looking for, like, you know, OBGYNs, like, accountants. And so, there hasn't really been a go-to place for black people over like the past decade where people can go and find these things. Like, you know, back in the day, there was like, I think the green book, there was a black, the black pages. And you know, that we um, were much better as a community about knowing where we could find, you know, information about black owned businesses. But, you know, with the, um, with the rise of like social media and internet, we kind of lost that. And so um, we came up with the idea of shop black. And so our first thought was instead of launching a database, because there have been many databases that have been launched 
and people and try it, to do apps and those kind of things. But right. This is- yeah. But when you go on there, like maybe five businesses in your city. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, why am I going on this app when I really can't find any black owned businesses? So like, I mean, you only have about maybe 2000 businesses at the most in your database. Or if you go into the website, I mean, it looks janky, you know, I mean, like the graphics are, you know, janky, the images are janky. Mm-hmm. You go and click on some links and the business no, no longer exists. And so instead of rushing to launch our database, I was like, you know, we should focus on content. Like people are hungry for content about, you know, entrepreneurs, about businesses, about, you know, black aesthetics and black culture. So why don't we provide that in the, in the site, which we've done successfully over the past year. And so what we're working on now is actually launching our database, which will be launching um, during Social Media Week Lagos in Nigeria in February. Nice. Um, which will feature thousands of black owned businesses, not only in the U.S., but around the globe. Now, how will that database be available? Will that be available through an app or will that be the- available? Initially, through our website, you'll be able to go to shopblack.us mm-hmm. uh, to access the database. And um, and then, uh, we'll, you know, we're going to test it out, do a beta run with the website first, and then we're going to build out the app. I love it. Now, for everyone listening, that's shop, S-H-O-P-P-E, black.us. Yes. I love it. That's fantastic. Now, how are the uh, businesses selected? Is there a process? Do people submit their businesses? What do you guys do for that? I mean, we, it's a multiple ways. Like, so if people go on the website now, you can submit a business. Um, we love word of mouth. You know, we definitely love when people have, you know, experienced, um, uh, supporting a particular business and they, you know, they're pleased with their service. And so then they tell us about it. Um, but then like sometimes businesses themselves, like just reach out to us. I mean, like a lot of businesses have reached out to us, but you know, we definitely do our homework. So right. we want to make sure that we're supporting, businesses that you know care about black dollars businesses that care about their own business so you know they make sure that they their website is great and um you know like that they they're actually open during the hours that they said they're going to be open so you know we have a group of people um interns who actually you know go online to see whether or not links work the businesses are actually open uh you know to find out whether or not these are actually businesses that, you know, would be great for us to support. And so we're always looking for stories, like amazing stories, interesting stories about entrepreneurs, particularly ones who are like being innovative. Like there was a woman in Detroit who started uh, like an Uber company for kids called Kids Cabs. And then that story was like shared over like 100,000 times um, when we first featured her. I saw so, that. Like, that was great. Yeah, and we did a post about um, um, 20-something businesses for, like, plus brands for, you know, plus-size women. Mm -hmm. That post has also been shared, like, hundreds of thousands of times. And so, you know, we're always, like, really interested in, like, highlighting stories that uh, we might not typically hear about, like, on Black Enterprise or Ebony or, you know, in Forbes, um, stories about, like, you know, your cousins, your sister-in-laws and you know, your homegirl from college Mm -hmm. um, that people will be interested in supporting. Right. And as you mentioned, it's not just a database. It it has so many other like you do profiles of people that you just mentioned and that kind of thing. So it's really it's content driven. Definitely. And I mean, you know, we're going to be launching other um, other uh, series like um, the majority report where people actually be able to like submit stories about experiences that they've had Mm -hmm. patronizing a black owned business, whether it was like good, bad or ugly, you know, Mm -hmm. like if you go to a restaurant and you had the most amazing time and the food was delicious and the customer service service was excellent, then we want to hear about that. If you hired a contractor like we did, you know, supporting a black owned business and, you know, we hired this contractor to come in to start doing some work on the house. And like the guys that this contractor um, had working for him, we're coming in drunk, mm. we're fighting, cursing each other out, we're painting, not using drop cloths, so it was like paint all over our, our hardwood floors, and it was horrible, and so I wouldn't want people to like, either I would want people to go back to that business if he got his act together, mm-hmm. or for them not to support that business, because I feel like people need to be held accountable, like, you know, black business owners like rely on us to support them, but then sometimes they don't hold up their end of the bargain, um, 
when it comes to, you know, uh, providing the type of service that, you know, they should provide. Right. Um, that's a good point. Customer. So it's important to have exceptional service and not just just be a black business in order yeah, to be featured. Absolutely. I mean, like even for my myself, you know, I have a um, a, um, a bow tie company called yes. William James. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like sometimes like people might order and I might be out of ties, you know, maybe because the website didn't, you know, like uh, didn't uh, automatically place a sold out you know, sign on a particular tie. And so in those instances, like, you know, I've reached out to, you know, the customer and, you know, I've offered everything from like a free bow tie, um, you know, to like, you know, deep discount, like all kinds of things that I've done just to make sure that, you know, my customers needs were being met. Now let's talk about William and James, the bow tie line. It's a custom bow tie line, right? Yes. It's, yes. Um, Bespoke bow ties um, made by tailors in New Orleans and um, in Harlem. And uh, it was something that grew out of the Danny Line Project. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't even know how. <laughs> how I came to like, I'm just going to start, you know, making bow ties and not making them myself, but like selling bow ties. Well, you know, what's funny is um, there's a, a psychic that I go to. She's also a Howard grad, one of my sorors, and her name is Jamila White. And I, I had a reading um, with her, and she told me that like, she told me about you know my like future husband. And she said you're gonna be selling some kind of product, like you're gonna be making it and you're gonna be shipping it out. And I was just like selling product, like and again with all of this stuff on my plate, you know, like curating these exhibitions and you know, doing research in the Netherlands, I was like, I don't have time to be, you know, selling stuff, you know, starting some kind of company and shipping stuff. I don't know what she's talking about, but lo and behold, like maybe less than a year later, um, I started this bow tie company that's been really successful. Um, and the boat, you know, the company is inspired by William, um, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and James Baldwin, um, each collection is inspired by different black men in history and contemporary times from the uh, leaders of African revolutionary movements to my most recent collection, the fall winter 2016 collection, which is a nod to um, the black Greek um, fraternities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so um, it's just been fun. I mean, I just like, I, you know, I just get joy from like you know coming up with these bow ties picking out the fabric having them made you know delicately delicately wrapping them shipping them out and like people telling me about how much you know whether they bought the bow ties for a gift or they bought it for themselves like how much they love them you know it just you know, kind of brings me some kind of like small joy mm-hmm. just to you know share this with people and the website for that is william plus james james.com right yep. and people can go on there and order yeah i love them they're fantastic i was looking through all of them and i love the intention as you mentioned of what's what's behind the brand i think that's i would imagine that's something that people that resonates with people too absolutely excellent Absol- so you are an evolving entrepreneur it's just sort of happening for you. It's happening. I have no idea. Like people are like, how do you do? Well, first of all, I'm not a mom yet. So that's one way. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> Is that. I mean, it's so, I, I mean. I think you're ahead. also, yeah, I think it's, um. well, one of the things that I've seen in, in, or heard from you in this story is just this idea of following the joy of people talk about your passion. But I think it sounds like joy is very important to you too. Joy is like, central to Mm -hmm. everything I do. And I have a friend, um, a close friend, um, my accountability partner, Cleaver Cruz, who founded the Black Joy Project. And um, we're just constantly talking about like joy in our lives. Like I work for my my nine to five in air quotes um, is an organization called the Future Project, um, where we literally place people who are living lives of passion into public schools to help young people do the same. and so uh, we teach possibility thinking in public high schools. And um, like we're constantly talking about possibility. We're talking, constantly talking about passion, but like the things that also like make us happy. I mean, the reason why I do the work that I do because like I love black people mm-hmm. and studying black people gives me joy. Um, seeing us win gives me joy, um, immense joy. Like black excellence gives me joy. 
Um, and so that is why I do what I do. Um, and it's like very, you know, it's, 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 it's critical. Um, watching Elvin Ailey perform brings me joy, you know, mm-hmm. um, like sitting down and eating like a, you know, well cooked meal, um, that, that, you know, that has flavor, um, that, that, that resonates with me. It brings me joy, um, amongst like, you know, people that I love. And so, um, I think that is like really critical. Like, and I think we need more of it. Like, I mean, this work is hard, you know, like when you think about what we have to experience as a people, like, uh, Sharon Kuti, Philip Kuti's son was on Facebook. We were talking about the, the quote unquote hotel wars going on uh, between okay. Umar Johnson and this other guy in, in, uh, Detroit. And, you know, and, and he was just talking about like, you know, like what, you know, what we're experiencing, like how critical it is to people. And like, you know, there's all these distractions. And I mean, it's painful, you know, sometimes like being black, um, a lot of times being black. And um, and so I think the only way that we can maintain our sanity and the way that we can wake up every morning is that we're committed to uh, celebrating, experiencing, producing a level of joy in our lives every day. Excellent. Now, what would you say entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman? Um, I think it's taught me tenacity. Mm-hmm. Um, it's taught me like the power of vision. I remember um, the, when I first branched out to work, I mean, there's been a couple of times when I've worked um, independently, like outside of like having a nine to five. Mm-hmm. Like cause for me, having steady income is like critical to my peace of mind right. um, and my sense of well-being, AKA my sanity. Um, and so, you know, it's not easy, um, but it's like, you know, I remember like in, you know, my darkest times, dark being like, what am I doing? Uh, like, does this make any sense? Like, why am I doing this? Like having a vision, like having like a vision as a North star, where there's like your vision board, or it's like a journal that you can go to, um, something that is like guides you, like so that you can always remember like why it is that I'm doing what I'm doing, why am I making the sacrifice that I'm making? I think that's so critical. And like you need, um, you need something, in, you know, like whether it's like some type of yeah, like joy. Like I remember, like I was, I I have a, you know, uh, I'm not in therapy right now, but I I I definitely subscribe to therapy Mm -hmm. I feel like everybody needs a therapist and I remember like during some of the most challenging times like when I was working independently uh and like money wasn't coming in like I thought it you know would like I would just do small things like make myself happy like whether it was like I'm gonna go to Lush and buy me like a bath bomb and like take a bath or, you know, like go and get a manicure or like if I'm just going to go to brunch with my friends. Like I just always made sure that I did something that um, like gave me pleasure, mm-hmm. like something that I found enjoyment in uh, that I was able to treat myself. Um, so, that it, you know, just it kept me going um, in the times like I was most challenged. But, you know, like you need to have vision. You need to have a uh, vision. You need to have tenacity. You need to like be able to persevere because it's not easy. And there'll be times when people will doubt you. You'll doubt yourself. Like, why am I doing this? Is it worth it? And you have to keep going. So like when I look back at my journey over the past like decade and the different like trials that I experienced, what kept me going was like my vision. And it's like, even when I look at my vision board, like I'll be for new years, like staying in the house, working on my vision board and my intentions for 2017. But when I look back at my vision board, like stuff that I've been having over there on the past, like having, having on my vision board for the past seven years, like it's come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I remember like when I was making the vision board at the time, those things weren't real, but like over the course of like seven years, they became real. And so I really think that that's power and like claiming, you know, what it is that you want um, to happen in your life, like the reality that you want in your life. A lot of us are spiritual people, we're religious people, whether we're like we're Christian or we're Buddhist or we're, uh, we practice Islam or we don't have any kind of religious practice at all. And I think a lot of us as black women particularly are, um, you know, spiritual beings. But what I found is that 
a lot of people don't practice spirituality. Like people don't have a spiritual practice. Like Mm -hmm. people are not meditating. People are not physically creating the reality that they want for themselves, whether it's like writing stuff down, whether it's like creating a vision board, whether it's like doing some kind of like ritual to like call in the one or like the love that you want in your life. Like I think that, you know, spirituality is a practice love is a practice joy is a practice these are things that you can't just talk about it. you can't just pray for it like oh i want to pray for a husband i'm just gonna pray for a husband no you have to you have to practice the love to call in your husband like what books are you reading Mm -hmm. what kind of people are you hanging out with like if you're hanging out with friends and all y'all doing is talking about like oh they don't have no good men and blah 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 blah, and you know just like lamenting on the lack of love versus like conjuring like, oh, yes, girl, like I'm about to conjure my man. Like, I'm about to call in my man mm-hmm. and I want to like hang in these circles like around positive people. Like if you're not actually practicing these things, you know, even in the, in, in, in the relationships that you already currently have with your friends and your family members and like your colleagues and your community, like how are you going to get these things that you want? Right. If you, you want to like, find love, you have to be love. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Um, so I think like for me, like being an entrepreneur, um, just being a purpose, a person who's like living as purpose, I think vision is essential. I think joy is essential. And I think practice is like very critical to like, what is it you do? Excellent. And I love that you said, you mentioned about vision. I do vision boards too every year have been since, oh, I don't know. It's been over six or seven years now. Um, and very much believe in writing things down. I've been journaling forever, but Mm -hmm. to your point, It doesn't happen right away. Like just because you put it on your vision board in 2016, as you mentioned, you have stuff that's manifesting now that you had on your vision board seven years ago. Right. So that's the thing, too. I think sometimes to your point about practice, sometimes people think, oh, I did a vision board last year and nothing happened. Well, it's a constant practice. Yes. It's something you have to continue to do and believe in. Absolutely. And not that the, the, and what do you think? Not that the vision boards are quote unquote magic, but the practice of having one, seeing it and all of those things. I think too, sometimes people think I'm going to put this up and this is magically going to make things happen. Right. No, you have to like, I mean, I, I mean, like take action. Take action. Like I I remember um, years ago when I moved back home after the storm um, to revitalize the McKenna museum, which is a, you know, a black owned, um, uh, art museum in New Orleans, I listened to uh, an interview um, by Will Smith where he said, like, nobody's going to outwork him. Right. He was like, nobody will outwork me. And I feel the same way. Like, I work harder than uh, 99.9% of the people that I know. I mean, like, seven days a week. Like, I'm constantly working. And it's not, I mean, because that could be a bad thing, like, being a workaholic. But, I mean, I also, you know, enjoy myself. Like, I travel a lot. You know, like if, you know, I spend time with my friends, you know, I spend time with, you know, my spiritual family. So it's not just all work and like no play, but I work so much. I have, you know, my passion planner that I'm writing in. I have my things to do notebook. And so I break down my larger goals towards like smaller goals. So like weekly, you know, I, you know, I start my week off with a list of things that need to get accomplished. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm constantly thinking about like, what can I do to be better? Like, you know, what, what's stopping me from reaching whatever my end goal is? Like, what are best practices that I need to employ? What are things that I need to stop? Like, I know f- for me, early morning meetings do not work well for me. So why would I schedule a meeting at 9 a.m. when I'm just not that person at 9 a.m. every morning? I mean, right. I'm up. Right. But I'm not trying to have a conversation with anybody at 9 a.m. in function, you know. So why do that? Why schedule a flight at seven or six o'clock in the morning if I know that I'm going to miss that flight? So, you know, it's also about knowing yourself, being self-aware, knowing yourself um, and creating and establishing best practices that's, that are going to help you be successful. Right. As opposed to work against you. Yes. Now, what does your support network look like? My support looks like a uh, network looks like the entire African diaspora. <laughs> I'm serious. I say that it takes a village and it takes a village to keep me sane from my parents to my husband to my best friends, whether they were like best friends from like childhood or college or graduate school, my spiritual family, um, like, you know, uh, in my, my spiritual house, Ilay Ashe, 
um, to like friends in the Netherlands, friends in London, like friends in Tanzania. Like literally, I have a huge network of people that I'm constantly on the phone with, on FaceTime with, on Skype with, on Google Hangout with on any given day at any given time. Like Tony knows, like I am talking on the phone with multiple people because I'm just a phone person. Mm -hmm. And so I have multiple conversations throughout the day with different people. And I know everybody's life is not set up that way, but um, I guess it's very important for me like to talk out my ideas, to talk about whatever it is that I'm working on. Like my best friend, um, Dr. Yaba Belay and I, whenever we talk and we talk multiple times a day, we ask ourselves like, oh, so what are you doing today? And when we say what are we doing means like what's on your agenda? Like what are you trying to accomplish? What are you going to do to be productive? Like even this conversation, I almost forgot even though yesterday, you know, I had the reminders and I'm sitting here and I'm planning out like New Year's Eve and everything. So y'all was like, okay, so what's on your agenda for today? Like what are you trying to get accomplished? And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I have this, this podcast that I'm going to be on today. She was like, see? trying to help you be the greatest. I was like, thanks, sis. <laughs> right. Appreciate you, sis. Thank you, Yaba. And, right. So, <laughs> but, but we do that every day. We constantly, like, when we when we get up and we talk to each other in the morning, we're asking ourselves, like, you know, what are we trying to get accomplished today? And some days, you know, we might be like, I'm tired. I don't feel like doing anything. And we support each other in that, too. Like, you know what? You probably need to take a break, you mm -hmm. know, because you're a little stressed out. So we support each other in those ways. And so I think that everybody needs community everybody needs a support network people need accountability partners right you know people that are going to hold you accountable for your finances for your relationship goals for your social goals um like whatever they, they may be you need people that can kind of like if you don't have people in your corner who are who believe that whatever it is that you think is possible for your life is possible get rid of them mm -hmm. um if there are people like you don't have people in your corner who actually is manifesting the same types of things that you want for yourself, like you're only as successful as the five people closest to you. That's right. So you can't be wealthy. You can't have a great relationship. You can't be healthy. You can't be like traveling, doing all these different things. Like if the people closest to you, if that's not their reality. And if it's that, if it's not their reality now, if they're not working towards that being a reality, then you need to assess your social circle. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Yaba Blay is a good person to have on your side. She is. I love her. We did an interview with her, too. So I'll have a link to that for everybody listening. You have been wonderful, Chantrell, as just oh. as I expected. Um, I want to ask you one closing question. If you mm -hmm. think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Uh, my mama, <laughs> I know. And it's going to make me emotional a little bit. It's so funny because like growing up, my mama and I were at war. My mom's an Aries. I'm a Gemini. So it's like fire and air. And, you know, I don't know. Like my mom, I think she was, you know, a very independent woman, educated woman. And I think that she wanted me to like avoid maybe some of her um, you know, like mistakes in life. And so she wanted me to do things her way. And when I became an adult, though, she like grew into myself as a woman. Like, I mean, she started to accept me for who I was, but throughout all of that, my mom always, always, always like made sure that I had books that reflected me as like a little black girl. Um, like make sure that my self esteem was intact. She was exposing me to like any and everything that I want to do and whatever I want to be. Like my mom was always, I mean, both of my parents, you know, my two dads and my mom, but like my mom has been like critical and like, um, just definitely, like, I've not been able to do anything without my mom's support. Like mm -hmm. everything, like I, I just literally believed that I could fly because I knew that I had the safety net in my mother. You know, my mother was just very ambitious. She had an amazing career herself. And um, she's just always been my biggest cheerleader. So I think, you know, my mom, like without a shadow of a doubt, um, has been that like person in my life, like throughout every phase of my life. Like, you know, whether I failed, my mom was like there to pick up the pieces, you know, um, to tell me that I was going to be OK, um, to tell me that I was going to be all right, that everything was going to work out um that and she believed in me and so you know definitely you know mom you know you are the best i mean she doesn't have a problem with tooting her own horn um because <laughs> she is an aries 
So she has no problems with letting everybody know that she is that person in my life. But yeah, my mom, like, you know, I just, I could never repay you. So yeah, definitely my mom. Oh, thank you for sharing. That was beautiful. Mm, it, it's the truth. She's, like, she's tagging me on a post on Facebook right now. <laughs> Wait till she's here. This now she's gonna have right. a recording of you saying how wonderful she is. She's gonna be like, remember that time you said that I was your everything? Exactly. <laughs> TBT <laughs> Christmas nineteen eighty five, and it's a picture of us with her. Like so, you know, my mom. Yes, like I said, she has no problem with tooting her own harm, but it's well deserved. <laughs> it's well it. deserved. Now tell us how we can support you. I will have links to every, and I got to tell you, I have two pages of notes here. It might be the longest in history of all the fantastic fantastic resources you mentioned but tell everyone um how we can support you first by buying a bow tie for a bow for yourself for your dad for your uncle co-worker go to william plus james.com get a bow tie um then by going to uh shop black sign up for our email list um filling out our survey we have a survey um and I can send you that link as well. Like okay. we're trying to get a thousand respondents um, to give us their top 10 favorite black owned businesses around the world, wherever they may be. Uh, and to fill out that survey and then to like buy the book, um, go to Amazon, go to Target.com, pre-order the book. Um, can we do that now? Yeah, oh, okay, excellent. I can do that now. Definitely. The book is on um, pre-sale. So um, those are the top three ways that people can support um, everything that I'm doing right now. Excellent. And for the bow ties, is there a, was there a discount or something that of I saw? Course. Support is sexy. 50% Yay! off to anyone that goes and buy a bow tie. I mean, we have some. I mean, I love the bow ties. Like, I, I mean, it's too. just it's just so I mean, it's just so I don't know. It's just so much fun. And it's just like just to see a well-dressed man. I mean. Tony is not dandy. He's dapper. He's dapper. But he's not, he's not dandy. So, um, I mean, he will wear a bow tie every now and then. But, like, I mean, those bow ties are just so sexy. <laughs> I just love seeing um, people wearing bow ties. So Yeah, well, I like what I see, at least of the materials from what it seems of the pictures. It doesn't seem like your standard material. Like, some of them seems like they might be made of wool. Wool, leather. Yeah. Like I have this purple leather one um, that I, I made for the for the bras, for the cues. And I mean, the thing about it is like anybody, like you don't have to be in a fraternity to wear the bow ties. Because like even some of my friends who are like, like one of my friends who's a Kappa, he bought one of the Alpha bow ties. He was like, yo, that joint is fly. Like I'm about to get that joint. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, I mean, but it, it's just, it's just a lot of fun. And it's, it's um yeah, it's like high quality and it's just... That's just a lot of fun. Excellent. William plus James dot com and support yep. is sexy at checkout. Is that where we yes. enter it? And we yep. get 15% off. Thank you so much. I appreciate of course. that. Excellent. Elaine, thank you. This okay. is like one of the best interviews I've had in a very long time. Oh, Chantrell, don't make me emotional. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I really I am always honored when people say that. So I receive that. Thank you. Now, before you go, you gave us so much wonderful advice and I said resources. But what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners? About anything? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, uh, do you. Like, do you, be you. And when I say that, I mean, like, be authentic. Like, the reason why I think my wedding spoke to so many people, because, like, that was Chantrell. Like, everything about that was Tony as well, clearly. But it, I wasn't trying to, you know, like, imitate somebody else's, like, wedding or like what someone else's idea was about being a bride. Like I was like, I'm about to wear a gold sequence gown with ostrich feathers. And like, I'm going to have a flat top with a part on the side of my head. And, you know, second line in the street, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And, um, and, and it was really about like myself, like being authentic to myself. And so even if I'm curating exhibitions, I'm curating exhibitions based on what, I'm passionate about like what interests me and so I'm not doing what other people are trying to do I'm not really as concerned about what the people think about you know what is that I should be doing like I'm doing what's important for me and I think the more authentic you the more authentic you are um the more grounded you are in yourself like people love and appreciate and admire you for that and people support you for that so I would just say be authentic that is the like do you like, who cares what anybody else thinks about it? Your friends, your parents. My parents haven't always thought that what I was doing was, like, the best thing for my life. 
Um, but at the end of the day, like I had to do it for myself, you know, whether it's like my spiritual practice, whether it was like my career, where I live, like whatever, like I'm, you know, I'm just true to myself. Um, and that allows me to go to sleep at night um, with a peace of mind. Excellent. Chantrell P. Lewis, thank you so much. Hold on for just a second. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Chantrell P. Lewis. Now be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com so you can get all of the resources, find out more information about the discount that she mentioned on William and Jane's bow ties. Also, you can see the video from her fantastic wedding and all of the other great information shared in this episode. And while you're there, be sure to go to the top and hit subscribe so you can subscribe to our email list. Want to make sure to get in touch with you. We will not spam you. We'll only send you information about the great episodes that we do here on Support is Sexy so you can stay in the loop and not miss a thing. Again, thank you so much for listening. And now you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.